Hello YouTube! My name is Dylan Rambo and I'm a PhD student at Northern Illinois University. Today I want to talk to you about direct and inverse limits. So before we dive into it, first off, the use of the word limit here has nothing to do with the limits you learned about in calculus. It's a completely different use of the word. Okay. So we're going to start off with the definitions and constructions for direct limits and then maybe talk about an example or two of an interesting structure created with the use of a direct limit system. For starters, we need to have a partially ordered indexing set, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just assume our indexing set is the natural numbers. We're going to let a sub n be a group for all n. You can do this construction in just about any category with, any, with pretty much any type of mathematical structure you can think of, but again, for the sake of simplicity and concreteness, we're going to focus on groups for now. We also want to have a whole bunch of homomorphisms between them. We're going to note them by B. And we're going to want them to satisfy the following properties listed here. So this first bullet point, the first line there, that pretty much just says that composition of these homomorphisms is going to work out nicely, work out how you might expect them to. And the second line is obvious. So the next thing we want to do now is to set up this group B that we'll define this way as the disjoint union of all of the different groups A sub n. If you haven't seen it before, that symbol there is an upside down capital pi, and that's a symbol we often use to denote a disjoint union. The next thing we want to do is define an equivalence relation on this big set B, this discrete union. So we're going to say that two elements of B, just call them little a and little b, that came from different original groups are going to be equivalent if they get mapped to the same spot in a different group under the appropriate homomorphism. The set of equivalence classes under this relation, then, that set is what we would call the direct limit of the sequence of groups A sub n. And we denote it like this with the limit sign and then a, just an arrow. So notice I haven't put any restrictions on the types of homomorphisms other than the two conditions that you saw earlier. I didn't require them to be injective or surjective or anything like that. So let's cook up an example. Let's start by letting k be a field, and our sequence of groups will be the general linear groups of every dimension, so gl1, gl2, and so on. The homomorphisms between them will be this embedding here, where we keep the matrix, and we just put a 1 in the very bottom right corner, and zeros in that uh, row and column. So that'll take a matrix in gln, and place it in a GLN plus one. Okay, so when you have these groups and these homomorphisms linking them, the direct limit is what we sometimes call the general linear group of the field, just denoted by a simple GL of K. So notice there's no subscript there, so it can be easy to confuse GL of K with GL1 of K. And GL1 of k is just the invertible elements of k. GL of k is this direct limit. They're very different structures. So this group GL of k is sometimes thought of as the group of infinite dimensional matrices over k that differ from the identity at only finitely many entries. Obviously, it's not literally that. The elements of this, of this group GL of k they're, in, they're equivalence classes of matrices, not single matrices. But when you think about some of the details, the comparison is perhaps appropriate. For example, every equivalence class contains infinitely many matrices, and in particular, each equivalence class will contain matrices of arbitrarily large dimension. And every single equivalence class will all but one of the matrices will look like the identity except for at finitely many entries. So given all of that, the comparison starts to make a little bit more sense. 
Another useful example of direct limits is if you do this in the world of rings, you can create a structure called the ring of germs of continuous functions. I'm not going to get into the details here because it's a little bit complicated, but I'll leave it to the interested viewer to go learn about that on their own. All right, let's now turn our attention to the inverse limit system, which in my experience comes up a little bit more often than direct limits. So a lot of the same settings will apply. We're still going to assume the naturals is our indexing set, and we'll still work with a sequence of groups. Although like for the direct limit, this works in a much broader context. Our homomorphisms, however, are going to be different. In the direct limit, we have homomorphisms from AI to AJ, I being less than or equal to J. In the inverse limit system, they're going to be going the opposite direction. So they'll be going from AJ to AI. And the corresponding properties that we'll want these homomorphisms to satisfy are these two here. The second one is exactly the same. The first one is pretty much the same as what we saw with direct limits, except making the change for the fact that our homomorphisms are going the opposite direction. We still want composition to work nicely. It's the ultimate point. Also, the concluding structure that we set up is going to be different than the direct limit. Instead of a discrete union, we're going to look at the tuples. So the inverse limit of that sequence of groups or whatever objects you're working with will be a substructure, subgroup in the case of groups, obviously, of the full direct product such that the tuples follow with the homomorphisms that you had defined. And more precisely, it means exactly this here. And so let's look at an example to get a better understanding. The big example I want to do is I want to construct the ring of p-adic integers uh, using the inverse limit system. So I made a video about p-adic in numbers and integers before. Uh, the link will be on the in the description, so you can go look back at that video to compare it. But in that video, we constructed the p-adic numbers topologically with Cauchy sequences and stuff. Here we're going to construct it with this inverse limit system, and we'll show why the two constructions are equivalent. So this is actually going to be done in the world of rings, because I said we're going to construct the ring of p-adic integers. The sequence of rings that we're going to have to work with is the following. So first, pick your favorite prime and call it P. The sequence of rings will be the finite rings Z mod P to the I times Z. So if, for example, you pick P equals 2, then your rings are Z mod 2Z, Z mod 4Z, Z mod 8Z, and so on. And the ring homomorphisms that we're going to define between these finite rings will just be reduction, specifically this here. Do indeed check that that is a homomorphism. It's worth your time to do that if you haven't before. So for example, if you choose the prime 2, a example of an element in this inverse limit might look something like this tuple here. If you notice, uh, 59, if you reduce it in mod 32, you get 27. If you reduce that in mod 16, you get 11. If you take 11 and reduce it in mod 8, you get 3, and so on. The claim, then, is that this way of constructing this inverse limit system, this will match the topological construction that we had before of the p-adic integers. Let's just refresh our minds how exactly that worked. The p-adic absolute value of an integer looked, worked like this. So if you're taking the p-adic absolute value of an integer n, you want to factor all copies of p out of it so that that m there is going to be relatively prime to your prime. And then the absolute value of that number is just p raised to the negative alpha. Alpha was that uh, exponent there. So the p-adic distance between two integers will look similar, like this here. So in particular, two integers are really close to each other p-adically 
if they differ by a very large power of your prime p. And that's important. Let's take a look back at that sequence, that uh, tuple that we had that we say belong to the inverse limit. That is going to be a Cauchy sequence according to your uh, p, the two attic absolute value. Because think about it, as you go on down the sequence, two subsequent numbers, they're either going to be the same, or, and, and then of course if they're the same, they have a p-adic distance of zero, or they're going to differ by a very large power of two, in which case they will have very, very small p-adic distance between them. So as you go on down the sequence, the terms are getting closer and closer to each other according to the p-adic metric, just like you want to have to be a Cauchy sequence. One of the last things to note then is that in this inverse limit, the two sequences will have a different limit if and only if they are actually distinct sequences, which is important to note. And then once you do this, then yes, if you complete this inverse limit system, you get the ring of p-adic integers. Well, of course, that's just the ring of p-adic integers. You can verify that this ring as this ring of p-adic integers that we've constructed via the inverse limit, it is an integral domain. Do check that on your own. And since it, inter since it is an integral domain, you can form its field of fractions, and when you do that, you get the full field of p-adic numbers. Another important example I want to talk about is a, an example from the world of Galois theory. If you have a field k, and let's just say that k bar is its algebraic closure, then you can describe the Galois group of the uh, algebraic closure over the base field k, you could describe that in terms of an inverse limit like this here. That f there ranges over all finite extensions of k that are contained, that are Galois extensions, one, and that are also contained inside of the algebraic closure. Note that in this context, using the natural numbers as our indexing set doesn't make a whole lot of sense. One, the natural numbers are totally ordered. And I, if I pick any two natural numbers, I can compare them with the less than or equal to sign. The, if I take two finite extensions of my field K, I can't necessarily compare them with the obvious uh, ordering of containment. One, isn't one field extension is not necessarily contained in another. So I'd have to use a different type of indexing set, which is okay and that indexing set will only be partially ordered, which is also okay. If you go back to the beginning of the video, I said, we, I said at the beginning that we only need a partially ordered set. So that's fine. So with that uh, ordering of containment, the homomorphisms between the various Galois groups will be restriction maps. And this, so this construction of the infinite Galois group of an algebraic closure over the field K is a really nice example of taking a complicated group and expressing it as an inverse limit of some simpler finite group. And that's actually going to be it for this video. If you're a graduate student somewhere and you want to record a video for us, send us an email to bygradforgrad at gmail.com. If you uh, have any questions about this video or have some suggestions of future topics for us to cover, leave those in the comments. And if you just want to keep learning, click like and subscribe. All right. Thank you for learning.